بزيدة الإيمان أن السلام حياة قد جاء في القرآن أن السلام Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to iTrend on ITV. I'm your host, Zahira Bam Ismail. Today is Women's Day, a day that we get to celebrate who we are and everything about the woman in our lives. So it was befitting that the woman talking about technology today is none other than the super tech guru of technology in our country, Nafisa Akaba. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Welcome to the studio and welcome back again. Thanks I for having me. Many of our viewers got to know you as the Nafisa Eats. And and we got to know the fabulous places you eat at and I absolutely love following your pages. But the one thing that you are actually passionate about, which is where everything lies, is technology. Yes, I've been doing it for quite a long time, so it is my passion. <laughs> Nafisa, tell us, I mean, for many of us, uh, we, you and I were having a chat offline here and I was saying to you, you know, my, my children are far more technologically advanced than I am. I have to give them a call to say, come and help me. Uh, my husband runs a fully technologically geared up household. and. I get so aggravated because I struggle to find my way around. How do you embrace it so easily? I th if you just play around, I think, long enough, you'll just get it. Or sometimes it's just intuitive or if the app is simple to use. I think everybody is just afraid without trying. So if you just give yourself maybe even 10 seconds or longer, <laughs> just to sort of... Longer for most of us. <laughs> just to see how it works and maybe press a button and see what happens. And just see what yeah. happens. So have you always had that mind where you just go around pressing a button just to see Well, yes, happens? I actually broke a bunch of things when I was younger. But uh, <laughs> I've always liked uh, playing with technology and computers when I was a teen. Fantastic. From the apps that you, we were discussing and some of your favorite apps that you mentioned, one of the apps was how to even just do your grocery list and your household shopping. Tell us a little bit about that app. Yeah, so one of my favorite apps is Home Budget. It can be used for a whole bunch of household stuff like your rent, grow, everything, but I specifically use it just to manage my food budget because that's what I, I want to know what I'm spending on food and groceries and I do my shopping on a weekly basis. So I track everything, whether I go, I'm going to Woolworths, Spa, Pick and Pay, wherever, I'm always putting it in there and then if I do buy takeout I also record it but then after a few weeks I realized how expensive the takeout is so I let my husband buy the takeout so that doesn't Smart. actually come out from the house uh, from the food budget for the yes. month yeah so that's my absolute favorite app so uh, these apps that we're discussing today are available completely on any smartphone anyone is able to download yeah it. so home budget specifically they give you the first three months free on uh, iPhone and Android mm -hmm. but um, you, you do pay for it it's very cheap it's like 99 rand a month to buy it however if you don't want to buy it you can just delete your older months like it'll track three months I just found it a bit tedious going back and delete Mm. all my entries and I thought it, I like it and I um, I'm using it all the time I might as well just buy it and that's a wonderful way for us to keep track of what our monthly uh, expenses are but also for students who need to know exactly how they're managing their money during the month and they're yes, staying away absolutely. from home and if you like even if you're going out to the movies using your entertainment it can be used for anything not food only yes. like your whole house even a business so this is an easily available one easily accessible and like you said three months free yes what about having to pay for things when you go out? Because I mean, when we're sitting out at the malls, I think one of the things that many of us uh, and many of my friends walk around with are all these loyalty cards that tend to make your bag so heavy and then you've got your credit cards and payment and everything just adds up. So there's two aspects to that I want to speak about. One is to store your loyalty cards and mm -hmm. one is to make payments. But let me quickly speak about making payments. Mm -hmm. Just recently, uh, Samsung Pay launched and then there's also Fitbit Pay with FNB and a whole bunch of apps called Zapper and Snapscan. So you can now make uh, payments from your phone mm -hmm. or from your watch or an app like when you're doing grocery shopping. Mm -hmm. So that really changed things for me and I absolutely love using I love not taking my wallet out of my bag, actually. I think that's the main thing. So if there, there are as many services around mobile payment, I will sign up for it. But how do we actually know in terms of how secure that is or how safe that is to be able to use it? Because I would worry about um, having a payment thing on hand on my watch that I'm able to make payments from. So it is secure in the sense that when you are loading your card for the first time, you have to verify it with your bank or there is a process. Mm -hmm. And when you're actually using it, you also need to authenticate. You can pin lock it or use your fingerprint or okay. iris scanning so there is that aspect and also when you are swiping uh, for it's under 200 rand they let you just tap it but anything above you are going to need a pin once again okay so and obviously this is information people can easily access from uh, any site or from your pages to be able to know how to utilize this. yes I did blog about the Fitbit pay and I've written about Samsung pay and I had mentioned to Nafisa that I, I walk around with that and all I do is I track my steps and nothing else so I didn't even know I could do all of that yeah, with especially it. with your Fitbit like me. You just pay like that. You just like tap your, your wrist, actually. So it's making things very easy 
first. It is actually. And also secondly, the store card. That's a specific app I use to put all my loyalty cards into it. So I don't mm. have a thick wallet. In fact, my wallet is my phone cover and I just slot a few cards inside. So what I've done is I've put my clicks to skim um, Toy Kingdom, <laughs> random <laughs> example, but a whole bunch of um, loyalty yes. cards. They're all on my phone and now mm. I just have to, I just show them at the till point and they scan it. Most of them accept it. Perfect. And that also becomes safe. Most of the stores accept it. So there's no hassle with yeah. that as well. And on the odd occasion, the scanner doesn't work. They'll just punch in the number manually, but then it's already on your phone. You don't need the physical That's card. That's it. Yeah. That's it. So we're becoming cardless as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Cashless and cardless. I love it. From all the apps, one of the apps that really uh, got my attention was the City app. Uh, and I know that uh, when we were traveling overseas, many people had told us, just download the app in the city. It gives you a lot of uh, explorers. I think it's called the Explorer course uh, or something. Uh, Google Maps, the Explore feature. There we exactly. go. And uh, it was giving you a lot of discounts for places. And I didn't even know oh, it was oh, effective. the Entertainer. The Entertainer app. Oh, That's yes. the okay. one. That's the one. I didn't even know that it was active in Johannesburg, let alone anywhere else in South Africa. Yeah, so the entertainer app I think originated in Dubai and yes. it's now in South Africa so Johannesburg Cape Town Pretoria and Durban as far as I know have them mm -hmm. it's a once of fee I think just under 500 rand or if you buy an early bird it's like 375 rand inside the app it gives you a whole bunch of buy one get one free deals so if you can find your favorite restaurants you can filter by halal or whatever Italian whatever type you want to do or if you want to go to a spa or if you want to cut your hair go for a color just take a friend with you and then you pay you as long as the two of you have the same treatment or order a main mm -hmm. something similar then it's buy one get one free and then you just split the bill and you save a whole lot of money so when people look at apps like this they often wonder is it worth putting in that initial amount and buying it are these apps because sometimes you know you think oh I'm gonna get discounts that I may never ever use and I'm never gonna have any benefit from it are these kind of apps really worthwhile loading onto your phone I think for people who eat out minimum maybe twice or thrice a month then you'll definitely see the difference over the 12 year 12 month period because okay. you're buying a and I'm subscription and it's valid throughout the year and they also add new restaurants along the way so I mean it is beneficial if you like eating out. What about people who are out there who also feel that they want to be contributors on that app so that they get the mileage of being able to advertise or uh, promote their own businesses are they able to also do that via the app or is that no, a separate I think, business? Yeah they would have to contact the entertainer the directly to push their own product. Okay yeah. perfect like I said I admit, I utilized that in Dubai and I knew it had huge benefits there I had no idea it was available here so that's actually very good news. No, it's worth it, definitely. And from these apps, which ones stand out the most for you? What are your favorite apps that you use all the time? Because I know you use the home budget one, which is fantastic. Uh, you're using your Fitbit to pay for accounts and that, but which ones are your favorite apps? So for me, uh, banking is very important. Like I can technically do my banking before I get out of bed and brush my teeth. So it's very important for me, all the payments I make and whatever yeah. I need to do every month, I sit wherever actually it doesn't matter where I said I can be anywhere and just have a Wi-Fi connectivity and, and use it to pay for stuff but for me as an F&B customer I like that I can renew my car license on the app so I don't even wow. have to now stand in a queue so for me I can just press a few buttons and okay sure they do charge you about 200 rand I think but for the convenience of not standing that's in a queue it. getting work done if I'm busy I have meetings I don't have time to sit in the traffic that's so it and there's so many that. of us that need to do that we uh, we struggle with it one of the things on the screen at the moment is the Google app uh, tell us a little bit about this one here okay so I love Google Maps I know people say oh you don't need it because you know where you're going I use it for navigation and if I need to be at an appointment you know, uh, at a certain time at two o'clock I know that I need to leave at a certain time and if there is traffic it'll show up live and I can redirect and see what's happening or if there's a major accident and I don't want to be stuck on the highway so I absolutely love Google Maps for a whole bunch of things and the traffic is just one reason but whenever I travel wherever in the world you just use the explore feature you can search for new restaurants for sightseeing anything basically so and everything is anything on and there. everything is on there and an, an additional feature is users putting their own reviews so if you go to a new restaurant yes. you tried in India for example you can put your own review upload your own photos and give other people tips so it's actually proper user generated and you can trust them because why would anybody lie <laughs> absolutely and it's something very personal so people are bringing yes. personal perspectives it's not just paid advertising absolutely. yeah 
Brilliant. And I love the idea of also being able to navigate traffic. I think in Johannesburg, that's a huge problem that we have. And you never know when there's an accident and a minor accident that causes you a two hour delay getting anywhere. So that's absolutely perfect. Yeah, I think just get a car charger and plug in your Google Maps and you're good to go. Absolutely. One of the uh, apps that Nafisa had spoken about that really got me grinning was the fact that she even uses an app to make her coffee in the morning. And that I had to ask you about. <laughs> so uh, my husband bought a coffee machine last year. It's a Jura uh, coffee machine machine and uh, it happens to have an accompanying app it needs to be connected to your Wi-Fi mm -hmm. at the coffee machine and then the, the the app when you open it one person can use it at a time and yeah you just decide what you want to um, it, it makes lattes cappuccinos macchiatos and that kind of thing but the interesting thing for me is you can actually edit the recipes so if the cappuccino <laughs> calls for a certain amount of milk you can say well actually I don't want that much let me bring it down a little or make it stronger. So you can actually tweak it and save that setting as your custom coffee. And in the morning, you just wake up and just ask it to, to make your coffee. I absolutely love that. I think that is now technology being taken to a completely new level, having your coffee made in the morning. It's fantastic. We're going to have to take a very quick ad break. When we come back, we continue discussing apps and how to simplify and make your life a little bit easier. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the show. We're discussing apps and everything regarding technology to make our lives a little bit easier. I think many of us are so daunted by technology, by what it can do. So we kind of just take the simplest way of using it. We don't even look as into how many other uh, features any app has and we work with just the basics. I know I do that often. And Nafisa is here today to tell us just how much easier our lives can be made. Nafisa, we were talking a little bit off air about um, smart homes and how homes are being run completely on technology at the moment. Tell us a little bit about that. So um, the Google Home speaker is available through, it is available locally, but not officially through channels, but you can get it on like one day only mm -hmm. or the Amazon Alexa speaker. So I have actually both those speakers in my home and I've set everything up so that it talks to my TV, to my lights. And if I want to turn them on, I just say, hey, Google, turn on the TV or hey Alexa, turn the bedroom light off. So I've managed to change all my um, light switches to Wi-Fi enabled ones. Mm -hmm. So it speaks to my phone and yeah, just via the app. So wherever I am, even if I don't really want to speak, I can just tap a little thing to say, turn bedroom light off. But how difficult or is it to actually do that transition of making everything uh, wireless or connected in your home? So once you do have a stable internet connection and you've got Wi-Fi and you're already using it, I think it's a good time to consider maybe switching like all your light bulbs or just looking at smart home solutions. Um, we bought our light switches off Amazon. So we didn't go the smart light bulb route. Mm -hmm. Actually, we went the smart switch route. Okay. So yeah, so we just got an, we bought a whole bunch of switches and we got the electrician to come in one day and just changed everything. And then on the internet, it's just available how to link it all up. It's actually very simple. Once you connect everything to the Wi-Fi, it's accessible on your app. And then also in terms of being able to run all your lights and your alarm systems, everything from your phone. Yeah, so I don't yet have the alarm system, but we're getting there. <laughs> but yes, everything is uh, run from the phone. So if I'm at another location, oh, well, actually, sorry, uh, I need to confirm this, but you can turn an, uh, the lights on and off when you're not at home. We actually do that. So See? like I said, I'm not technologically savvy at all, but my husband is. And I know that no matter where we are, we've actually been overseas a number of times and have managed to turn on lights, switch on alarms, switch off alarms, run our entire household just from our phones. Yes, that's completely possible. And our appliances are also getting the smart appliances. Like when you, you can <laughs> run your loads beforehand and, you know, or, or set your air conditioner to run at a certain time. That See, kind of all thing. we need to do now is make sure our home gets clean before we arrive back home. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, actually, there is a, a you robot see, vacuum cleaner for that. There Roma. we go. <laughs> so you see, there's something for everything. Yes. When we're speaking about smart homes and being able to run our homes again, I think for me, again, it becomes, it seems daunting. And it, it, I worry about just managing to switch on something as easily as just picking up a remote and putting on, uh, switching it on with one button or one press. But I suppose times are changing where children are finding it easier that everything is connected. It's actually very simple and a lot of the devices are now uh, voice enabled. So even mm. the kids, I'm sure you've, maybe your kids have done it already. They speak to this phone or mm. hey Google or hey Siri and they just ask it stuff like what's the weather or when which year certain, act, 
actor was born or whatever the case is, you know, yes. you can just, it's actually very simple. I think you just need to break that little intimidation that you have and just go with it. I know I've often seen my kids using it to ask information for school projects where they needed to know uh, information about, uh, for example, Martin Luther King. And they've just had asked it and the information comes through, which is uh, rather entertaining because we used to be at a time when we had world books and then we moved to the internet and now everything is becoming completely voice enabled. Yeah, you don't have to type anymore. All Absolutely. Right. Tell us a little bit about uh, traveling. I mean, we mentioned now that when you're traveling, you're able to run your home off your phone as well. But tell us a little bit about being able to utilize good apps during travel. So a few, I do have a few favorite apps when I travel, but before I travel, I do use like booking.com or Airbnb mm -hmm. or hotels.com mm -hmm. just to check for hotels and accommodation before I leave. And because the booking.com apps you do, if you are a member and if you, you do get discounts once you logged in. So I do monitor that and you can just do it straight from your phone. And there's also user reviews and there's also you can book with free cancellation that's also very important for me because mm, sometimes a better yes. deal will come up and then you even though you book that one then you just cancel it and then you book another one so it works the same with whatever uh, booking system you want to use if there's an app for it I think it's very convenient to just run it off your phone but um, for other aspects you can also use a currency converter app. I mean you know how around yes. <laughs> highs and lows you want to know what you're spending wherever you are so um, there's an XE currency converter app that I like using when I travel and you can also adjust it if your bank whatever percentage they put over on your cards you can also include it on the app to get an accurate figure so I knew that that was always on the internet because I was at search and look for that I actually yeah. had no idea that that was already ready as well as an app yes that you can just save on your phone and yeah take there it are around a few you. that you can do yes absolutely Which as long as you have obviously a Wi-Fi connectivity yes. where you are then you can search for the, the red days rate. right now everywhere you go you have Wi-Fi connectivity yes, so it's any absolutely coffee shop, easier. basically <laughs> absolutely so that's a wonderful way also of tracking purchases tracking how much you're spending converting things like that what I've also loved, and I'm not even sure, again, if it's a, an app, is a Google Translate in terms of being able to use different languages when you're going around. So I love Google Translate. It's another favorite app. You just download the languages for offline use before you travel. Okay. So that means wherever you are, you don't really need a connectivity. Okay. So they have stuff like Arabic and Vietnamese and Japanese. You can download them for offline play. And there are actually various ways that you can use it, which is very interesting. So if you are in a restaurant and you want to ask the waiter something and, and they don't understand, you just actually speak into your phone and it, it'll, it'll translate what you're saying in their language so that's very cool you can have a conversation Fantastic. with the person using your phone or you can just take a photo like when I was in Spain I took a photo of the rice I was trying to cook and it translated it for me live on the photo that I took so oh that's actually goodness. very useful and then you can type in so there's so many methods to use on Google they've really made it interesting and that's if you like um, you know for Arabic or Chinese if you want to if it's obviously you can't type it if you don't have the keyboard you can write it with freehand and that's also another input method so there's, there's a lot of options and that just makes the world so much more connected because you are able to have a full conversation with somebody even if you don't speak the same language yes. I mean I do travel for work and I've actually been in situations where we don't know how to communicate and then I obviously pulled out in Vietnam for example I had this app the whole time I was uh, typing it up and showing them and they were typing back and showing me the phone so it, we had a conversation and we knew exactly where to go and, and you know what to do I think that's gonna be one of my new apps that I actually download and start playing with because that yeah. sounds absolutely fantastic yeah definitely download it for offline and same with Google Maps if you're traveling and if you're going to a new city just make sure the maps are offline so that's the one trick is just to yeah. make sure you're available offline and it'll still be able to do the same yes. thing for you and just as effective yes great stuff one of the things that you touched on a little earlier that we didn't get into was about uh, ordering like Mr. D. If you want to order from home, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I, <coughs> sorry. Yeah. I quite like Mr. D food because they are owned by Take Lot, so they are very established and they have a whole bunch of drivers and I find them to be very efficient. <coughs> so um, like if, if I want to buy a takeout, I just open the Mr. D app, filter through what I want to buy and my credit card is loaded onto it, but uh, you do have an option to keep oh, cash on okay. delivery if you feel safer that way. But yeah, I just order uh, my food straight off the app and you can track it and it'll tell you when it's coming when it's ready and whether Fantastic. the restaurant picked up your order that kind of thing so that's also quite useful with everything being so technologically advanced and so much of our lives going onto phones and uh, watches and everything being literally living in this other world how safe are we? How safe is your identity, your information, uh, your credit cards that you're putting out there? How safe is all of that? So I think before you sign up to anything, you just you must read the terms and conditions to know what you're signing up for. Because Android in general, they do say they do. Google tends to they're very open about everything and they want to collect data on you, but. 
iPhone, on the other hand, they're very closed and everything is about keeping your stuff safe. So you yes. just need, firstly, to make a uh, choice of which operating system you want to use. And then further on, there are uh, pin codes and uh, fingerprint options that you can use to secure your stuff and make sure it doesn't get in the wrong hands. Because I think for many of us, we worry about the fact that we're putting in all this information, we are downloading all these apps, and very often like on Facebook or in any of the things, uh, if you download an app, it asks you for access to your information, access to your pictures, uh, and that always worries me in terms of yes. how much we're giving away. That actually is a big concern for me. It's one of the reasons I don't sign up to a lot of services because when I download it, it says, we want to access your mic, we want to access your camera, and I'm like, no, you don't need this kind of access yes. and that specifically has stopped me from downloading and signing up to many services I think you have to be aware of what you're giving access to at all times you know you mentioned now having access to a mic and to a camera um, and I think many of us are not aware of that because very often our kids are downloading something or we downloading and you just press allow 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 just to get into the app completely tell us a little bit about this concern with regards to giving somebody access to your mics or to your cameras well then the 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 downside is they're obviously going to know who you're speaking to, whatever the case is, like with the whole Facebook scandal that came out earlier this year, it also showed you that loophole that the operating system level gave it access because Google should have stopped it. Yes. But that's why it's so important to read it. And you obviously don't want, if your kids are using a smartphone, you don't want their conversations to go uploaded in someone else's uh, yes. cloud and that kind of thing, or access to their photos. I mean, Absolutely. Or you don't know when that system gets hacked, then their photos will be revealed. So you just need to make sure who you're giving access to. And I think that's so daunting because very often we think, oh, all our photos are on our, our phone and that's safe and that's protected because it's with us. But like we're saying, you know, if you're giving access to an app that gives them access to your pictures you're literally signing all of that away yeah i think just be careful about those kind of apps or just know what you, and just don't <laughs> you just don't download <laughs> just the, don't app. Download the yeah. apps i know one of the things that happened recently uh with shabnam khan who is the author of onion tears was that her she had pictures taken uh and it was sold all over the world um and she didn't read the fine print about the fact that she signed off her pictures. Yeah, that was the biggest lesson. She's a friend of mine and I saw that and yeah, it yes. was actually quite crazy when it happened. She just discovered random things. So that's actually a perfect example of why you should read the terms and conditions. Absolutely. And I think that's a, an eye opener for all of us because we, I'm sure everybody is excited to get into all the apps that Nafis has told us about, but also just read the fine print and make sure you know what you're downloading and you also know how to utilize it. Yeah. And just be wary of free photo shoots. <laughs> I'm very wary of free photo shoots. Nothing in life is free. <laughs> exactly. Nafisa, thank you so much for joining us on here. It's been such a pleasure chatting to you. Uh, you are truly a wealth of information. Uh, I'm sure we'll be following you on your social media accounts where you do upload on your blog as well, um, detailed information about apps that you are trying. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I am, you can go to nafisa.co.za and the, my information is there. Or you can follow me on Instagram at nafisa. Fantastic. I'm definitely looking forward to being far more technologically savvy so that my family feels and I start fitting in. <laughs> so thank you for that. Nafisa uh, is not just the food guru uh, of South Africa, but she's also the technological expert. Uh, anything with regards to what apps can do, what are the pitfalls, what are the perks about it, it's all on her blog. So follow her, find out about it, and let's just take that extra, she says 10 seconds, for me it'll be far longer than that, to figure out which buttons to press and what happens from there. Stay tuned, when we come back, we continue the conversation. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the show. From talking about technology and how to get ourselves tech savvy, we now speaking to somebody who's going to talk to us about making ourselves conscious about the way we, we live in this world and about the footprint that we leave behind. Mohammed Tahir Khan, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Welcome to the studios. Mohammed Tahir, you are very involved in renewable energy. Tell us a little bit about how you actually got involved with that and then we'll talk a little bit about it as well. Okay, so um, by training, I'm an electrical engineer by background. And I got involved in renewable energy when I was at Sassel as a junior engineer. And one of the goals that Sassel had at the time was to try and go uh, a lot more sustainable, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of not having reliance on ESCOM and, uh, you know, generating a lot of their own power. So uh, from that background, I got involved in solar PV and other renewable energy projects. And um, just from that day onwards, I mean, my career has grown on that. Um, and now up to the point where I'm... Um, involved in Zero Point Energy, which is a company that I co-founded with one of my partners. 
And uh, that's where we focus on solar PV, battery storage, energy efficiency, and those kind of projects. That's fantastic. And it's so good to see people at such a young age being so conscious about it. Very often, many of us think, oh, it's not our problem, it's somebody else's problem. Somebody else will sort it, somebody else will fix it. I mean, um, how important is it for everybody to take individual responsibility and not just leave it for corporates or for companies? I think it's it's quite important, um, you know, obviously, you know, you have to have the underlying understanding and the education and I think that's quite critical. You know, I wouldn't advise someone, you know, going into a space where they don't necessarily have the, um, the insight or the education mm -hmm. in it. And I think we were fortunate that we spent quite a lot of our careers developing in these fields, you know, working for multinational companies who had that expertise and we could learn from them. But then we reached a point where we realized that you know, we have all of this knowledge, we have the expertise and the capabilities, we need to back ourselves and actually use that in education, use that to try and benefit a lot more people than we would have been able to in the large mm -hmm. corporates. And I think what you're saying is quite important. And, you know, from an environmental sustainability point of view, uh, you know, we can't pass it on and say it's going to be the responsibility of our kids. And you just keep yes. passing that bucket down the line. So from a sustainability point of view, I think it's very important that not only corporates, but also individuals, uh, you know, bringing it closer to home, our own um, facilities, our own yes. massages, our own madrasas and our schools and all take that initiative to be as sustainable and environmentally friendly as possible. But very often, very much like our previous guest, Nafisa, was saying to her, you know, we hear all these new words um, and it just sounds overwhelming and when you talk about renewable energy and you're talking about wanting to take it into the massage and into the schools and into our addresses and people go I don't even know where to start just don't bring it here it just sounds too difficult how easy is it to actually start doing that transition to make ourselves conscious about where we're living and how we're living you know I think that's very important and uh, you know, they say to, to eat an elephant, you need to do it in small bites. Small and bites. <laughs> that's exactly the same, um, you know, philosophy you need to take in this approach. You shouldn't let it be daunting. And I think it's as easy as starting with, you know, understanding your energy consumption. You know, that's the baseline. If you understand how energy intensive you are currently, and that you can very quickly do by doing a brief energy audit. And from then, you know, if you get somebody involved who understands what they're doing and uh, help you guide you along that path, you move to looking at ways that you can introduce new technology to offset your energy consumption or you know take it further mm -hmm. and maybe you want to decide you need to install systems so it's a sequential process that you have to start by first doing an energy audit and then you continuously take it forward mm -hmm. i've heard many people saying you know what to make um our homes off the grid to take our homes off the grid it's just too expensive uh, because there's a huge outlay of capital initially and you're talking about changing things in the house, you're talking about bringing more things in the house. What is this expense uh, uh, in the short term and also is there a benefit and how soon do people start seeing that benefit? Because at the end of the day, it also comes down to bills. Absolutely. So I think the way that you need to look at any capital project, you know, it's easy to look at the cost and find that daunting. But if you look at it as an investment, which effectively that's what it is, it's a sustainable investment that you need to look at it in a long term horizon. So you will have that initial outlay, but when you look at the way that you save operational costs, so your monthly electricity bill reduction, you know, over five to six years at a, at a residential level, you can already see paybacks. Mm -hmm. So it is not as expensive as it was. Granted, a few years back, the technology was extremely expensive, but year on year, renewable energy, such as solar PV and battery storage, it has consistently been reducing in price mm -hmm. at rates of up to 30% per annum. So you can see as the technology matures, you are cons consistently having lower pricing, and then that just makes projects a lot more viable. So I think there is that misconception yes. that this technology is expensive and um, you know it's going to break the bank. But when you factor that in and you look at your rising electricity pricing from ESCOM and the municipal there is definitely a business case for residences uh, I would say currently it's in the five to six years but for commercial and industrial users that payback is as low as two to three years sometimes. Fantastic. so there really is a financial incentive let alone the environmental and the emergency load shedding uh, saving that you get as well as Muslims, I think um, we, we forget, we're conscious about everything else, but we forget that we also have to be conscious in our environment and the carbon footprint that we're leaving behind. Because as we mentioned earlier, we keep thinking somebody else will fix it, somebody else will sort it out. 
as an individual, if there are people who are watching or the kids who are watching and they say to you, what can I do? What can I do myself to be able to start making sure my carbon footprint is less? Uh, I think that you definitely have to look at it individually because, you know, everything starts at home and Islamically, we know that we have to do things on our own and it mm -hmm. starts at home. So, you know, in, in, the, in the first place, I think it's critical to um, instill an educational perspective, you know, teach our kids uh, to go green, to um, cut out our resource consumption. And those things are easy. I mean, it starts with simple things like making sure you don't switch off the lights, you're making sure that you recycle um, your mm -hmm. waste, you know, and then you slowly pull that up as they grow and as you get involved in, at the schooling level, you know, you teach children, it should be part of the syllabus or mm -hmm. they should be aware that, you know, there's energy efficiency, they should know that there's uh, opportunities that they can stay they, there's there's many different aspects of sustainable engineering, um, whether it's on the electricity side, or the waste management, on um, water efficiency. You know, it's what you mentioned about it being in. It's it's our Islamic principles that we should conserve water. I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said something to the effect that, you know, even if we're standing in a flowing river, we shouldn't waste that water. Yes. So you can see how critical and how important it is to the Islamic ethos. It is to 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 mm. inculcate an, a sustainable living. Um, philosophy and I think this the green energy and sustainable engineering fits directly into that mm -hmm. and uh, you know we currently are working with a number of masajid and Islamic institutions where we try to assist them and show um, you know the benefits not only the fees the financial but also on the sustainable benefits of inculcating um, um, an, a green energy sustainable engineering approach to the way that they develop and yes. construct their projects to the way that they run their costs and you know especially with our, um, our institutions it's a lot more easier to raise capital funds but not necessarily to sustain them on the operational yes. side so there's a huge benefit if you don't have to find um, you know, operational costs every month to fund your electricity and your water bills. There, there's that significant plus as well. So it, it definitely is, it ties up very well with um, Absolutely. Islamic. And I think also with the one thing you mentioned about the masajid, very often, and I know we've had this discussion before about taps being uh, left running while we're making wudu, something simple yeah. as that. And where the water goes, where we're getting that water from in the first place. And the fact that we're not making our children conscious enough to be able to understand, actually not even our children, I think they're far more conscious than we are. It's the older generation. Generations, right. where we're not conscious of the fact that many places in our country don't even have access to water. Uh, when the floods, uh, when the drought happened in Cape Town, I mean, it was the first time everybody started saying, oh my goodness, it's in the big places. Mm -hmm. But many, many places in South Africa struggle with that on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. You only really realize it when you don't have that resource. And you know, you see what happens when there's load shedding. Yes. And then there's this huge panic when you don't have lights for four hours. And then you think about the people who don't have running water and access to electricity on a daily basis. And I think that's where renewable energy also has a huge role to play in that it empowers people in the rural communities who may be too far from the, the current ESCOM grid mm. uh, to sustain themselves. And you know, if you can provide people with renewable, self-sufficient electricity and water, you know, that just opens up access to a lot of other, um, you know, value-added things where, you know, if you have electricity, then you have access to the internet, to mobile banking, that kind of thing. So I think renewable energy has that sustainable advantage in that it allows remote communities to be off-grid and to sustain without having to rely on government or municipal um, infrastructure. So that's another key. And I think that's something that I, I really do want to explore. Uh, I'm, I think we're going to have to come back after the ad break to talk about that. But I want to discuss also about how, giving back in terms of how we give back into communities and you're mentioning the solar energy and something as simple as a solar panel and how that changes lives of communities mm. and of people and we don't even realize that. No, absolutely. So we'll explore that a little bit. Uh, we're going to go for a quick ad break. When we come back, we'll continue this conversation. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the show. We're chatting to Muhammad Tahir Khan, who is discussing everything around renewable energy and how to make ourselves conscious citizens, conscious Muslims, not just in our actions and in our behavior, but things that not only impact uh, the people around us, but the environment around us as well. Muhammad Tahir, we were talking a little bit now about changing environments and speaking about even places that are remote or in rural areas. Why has solar panels not become a norm? I mean, in South Africa, we have phenomenal weather, we have good sunlight, even through winter. Why has that not just become a norm all over the place? 
I think it has largely to do with the historical pricing of the technology. So if you look as far back as five to ten years ago, uh, the technology was expensive. However, I think we are at a point now where mm -hmm. The, the low cost of the technology coupled with the increasing electricity tariffs that we see, it has put renewable energy and especially solar PV in a position where it can be extremely attractive to people, not only in the rural areas, but we see that, you know, even with companies and residences uh, as an emergency backup mm -hmm. or as um, um, you know, an alternate supply to ESCOM electricity, it, it is becoming a viable financial case. For me also, like I think about the amount of charity work that's being done in our communities. And you raised a very valid point of saying, you know, give people electricity and you see how much changes in their lives as well. And I think it also impacts on kids having access to being able to study at night, having access to mm. basic lights in their home, uh, heating systems in their homes. And I think we put so much into, and I do feel there is definitely a place for uh, food parcels and that. But no one has ever thought about saying, you know, let's just put electricity, let's try and find solar panels and make people independent. I think you hit the nail right on the head with that one. You know, uh, you can look at renewable energy and this newer technology as this fundamental enabler, you know, of all these things mm -hmm. for rural and uh, impoverished communities. And, uh, you know, while we also agree that, you know, you need to have a level of aid and mm -hmm. relief work, but by in investing this type of infrastructure and the nice thing is that there are a number of islamic institutions that we've started working with yes. who have looked into this and they see and they realize the benefit of instead of providing people with um, you know essential commodities which it is it, it is required place, yes. exactly but if you invest in this infrastructure you just a nurture a new type of uh, investment in that Absolutely. it now gives them power and then that gives them access to electricity it gives them access to education the internet and the, i mean agricultural equipment like That's pumps it. and irrigation so it's just that fundamental enabler which spurs on so much more and i think it's extremely attractive for me what i love about hearing that is that you're literally changing lives and you're mm -hmm. making a difference in somebody's life so it's not just uh, feeding them but you're teaching them how to fish exactly basically. That, that's what it is Mm. Tell us a little bit about water systems in our own homes. How can we make that more effective? This wasting of water is something that we all know about. It's something that we still think, oh, we need to fix it, but we're still waiting for someone else to fix it. Yeah, that's right. And you see the real uh, crisis that has occurred down in the Cape. Yes. And, uh, you know, with them and their water scarcity. And I think we don't have to wait for that to happen up here, even in mm -hmm. Johannesburg. We know that South Africa is a water scarce country. So if we want to take initiatives at home, the easiest thing to do is ensure that we install water efficient faucets on our taps and our shower heads and in any way that there's a water spout. Um, and that's the, that's the first, the easiest, the lowest cost uh, thing to do. After that, you can look at, um, you know, doing projects such as rainwater harvesting, where you uh, saving the water that your roof harvests during the mm -hmm. summer period and you use that water uh, whether it's in your garden or for washing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to take it a step further and this starts to have a bit more um, you know cost effective benefit for larger residences or maybe for um, commercial mm -hmm. businesses where you use a lot of your excess water generated from your rainwater harvesting system and you filter that so that it becomes potable and then you feed that back into your water reticulation in your house then you you value adding and you able to offset a lot of the municipal water that you would have been consuming so there's a number of things that you can do and it all comes down to um, the costs and you know the the, mm. the 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 benefit that you're going to get from it. So they are in easy things, the lower hanging fruit that you can do. Um, and start up. Exactly, and then you just keep building on that. And what I love about it also is the fact that when we're talking at a time when our areas are seeing load shedding all the time, are we seeing uh, times where people are saying there's no water coming into their homes, uh, and it's happening not just in Johannesburg, in suburbs in Johannesburg, it's happening all over the place. It is almost time to say, take yourself off the grid. It is. I think, you know, when, when you look at um, infrastructure provision from your municipalities and when you start seeing the frequency of these events becoming very often, there is definitely, uh, from what we've noticed, the trends, there you get an influx of people asking and, and querying about pricing. And I think at this stage in South Africa, 
the one thing as unreliable as people as, uh, people think of ESCOM, you know, generally speaking, the the, the electricity tariff mm. is still significantly cheaper than a number of other countries. Okay. Um, that you know, ESCOM is going to be loving you for saying that right now. No, it's it's, it's it currently that's the thing. Yeah. But if you look at the cost increases that they're going to have to be requesting, considering their financial position, you can just see that electricity is be going to become exponentially more expensive mm. each year and it does start making sense for uh, households and uh, businesses to think of going off grid and be self-sufficient mm. and that's definitely where um, renewable energy and energy storage such as battery storage has a place because that gives you that independence from the grid. Yeah. Again, you know, I think um, you're making it sound very feasible and attainable that it's actually something anyone can do easily enough. And they, they, like you mentioned, the low hanging fruits that we can start with, and that's not out of our reach at all. Mm. I have to ask you, why is this not in school syllabus already? That Why are our Muslim schools not teaching our children uh, from the outset already of what we are able to do? I think you know there is there is an element of um, recycling and sustainability that you know schools try to inculcate. It might not be very explicit and open, but you're right. There is a place for this, and I think you know at um, the higher um, standards or the higher grades, there is an element of sustainable engineering that can be factored in. You know, it's it, it it's a consolidated approach to engineering, and uh, you know that's something that we can look forward into integrating into school syllabuses. Fantastic. And it's it's it is important. And you keep mentioning the recycling, uh, and you're absolutely right. I see the schools do have that. Many of the schools push for that on a regular basis. How does that make a difference for those that haven't started with that yet? Uh, you mean if they haven't? With the recycling, just mm. in terms of why why would they need to put something like that in place? I think it's a mindset. You know, those are the easy, the small things. Mm. So if you get that right and you inculcate um, an education, and inculcate a behavior of always recycling, I think that's the stepping block, the stepping stone to bigger things. And uh, you know, it's it all stems from this. So if you encourage that, then people will start looking at other ways to be mm. sustainable and to be environmental conscious. In terms of electricity in homes and changing light bulbs to energy friendly ones, uh, I mean, you know, very often people say, but my house is already done. Why do I need to go back and start changing things mm -hmm. again? And then putting in these battery packs to make sure you've got a backup that's running. Tell us a little bit about that. So, you know, as we talked about the, the lower hanging fruit on the water efficiency mm -hmm. side, you know, replacing your um, globes at, mm -hmm. at home with LED or energy efficient um, lighting, that's the, the cheapest and probably one of the most important steps you should take as a first step when you're looking at energy efficiency in a house. Uh, by doing that alone, you can conserve and you can save a lot of electricity. I think with the battery storage, that comes more into play if you're looking at an um, as a backup solution in a load shedding event. Mm -hmm. So you won't necessarily see a return on investment for that because you basically in installing that to function as a backup solution. But on the, the the energy efficient lighting, if you look at an energy efficient water heating solution, you know, mm. water heating accounts yes. for like 50 to 60% of a residential uh, house's electricity yes. bill. So if you look at alternatives, uh, looking at um, maybe solar water heating systems or uh, more energy efficient um, heat pumps, that is another alternative to your conventional uh, keysers that we have at homes. So all these things, you know, whether it's um, insulation or if you're looking at at, uh, just ensuring that mm. you have uh, glazing on your windows and being able to control your building envelope so you conserve a lot of the heat and cold that inflows into a house. Those are things that you can get right if you include it during the design and, and, and the development of yes. your house because those things if you try to retrofit, they become more expensive. That's what I was just going to ask yeah. you. Because for people who are designing their home, that's easy to put into place now to say, we'll do the double glazing on the windows, we'll make mm -hmm. sure the insulation is in place. But what about those that are not? Uh, mm. Then are we still just saying, do the start with the low hanging fruits, go with the light bulbs, go with the water saving uh, aspects on the faucets. And those are things you can start with. Absolutely, because that's going to be the lowest cost items. So if you if you solve your uh, your energy efficient lighting and your water heating, that's already like 60% of your yes. electricity bill. So although it might be a bit more expensive to retrofit and start looking at, you know, um, uh, interfering with the architectural aspects of a house, 
um, that will come at a cost. So you have to look at the cost benefit of it and does it really make sense. But if you are looking at a new application, I think that's where it's very important to involve the engineers and yes. the energy efficiency aspects early on. How effective is it? I mean, we talk about having geysers and we talk about people moving over to solar heating or to moving to other air forms of heating water. And that. How effective is it? Because I know very often I've heard and I've often said that I think the geysers are far more effective. It doesn't heat it enough. Uh, is it just that we haven't found the right system in place or are things just progressing slowly? I think it all comes down to the way that the system has been designed and specified. Okay. Uh, there is a lot of criticism of solar water heaters. I think there's installers running around who promise the world and yes. they <laughs> deliver. And that's, that's common, you know, you need to avoid those things. With solar water heating, I think it's important to understand your water usage consumption during the day. And if you're not going to be using water at peak at midday, mm. which is often the case, We're not, not everyone yes. is showering and bathing at that stage, then you have to understand that you're not going to have the most intense water heating because uh, that's when the sun and the solar irradiation is the strongest. Mm. And generally speaking, we know that you're either showering and bathing early morning or early evening. So there is an element that you are going to rely on that the backup element yes. to heat water, which then questions, does it, de is it energy defeat efficient? the purpose? Yeah. Exactly. So I think it's just designing the system appropriately for understanding water consumption usage in that facility. And it comes down to that. And that's the way that you can optimize the system. So in terms of the technology, I think the technology has matured to a point where it's very efficient and very effective, but it's the application and how well fit it is to that. Okay. Mm. You, your company has got a wealth of information. I mean, in terms of being able to be uh, centrally based, but you have a wealth of resources, you are also having a large footprint yourself throughout the country. Where do you see yourself or where would you like to see yourself or and the community in terms of our carbon footprint going forward? I think we've executed a number of projects um, you know, across South Africa, but we are based here in Johannesburg. And I think looking forward, um, I think our mission is to try and uh, assist um, you know, clients towards on, on the road towards mm -hmm. net zero. And that's effectively to reduce your uh, energy and your uh, resource usage to the point that you self-sufficient. That's our goal and that's our mission. And I think to get to that point, you have to take um, a collaborative approach to this. And you can't just focus on your uh, electricity generation or you can't just focus on your water uh, resources. You have to take a sustainable engineering, holistic look at it. Mm. And I think if you do that, then the, um, the chances of success and the chances of being able to become as uh, environmentally friendly as possible is your highest. Fantastic. Mamatai, Jazakallah so much for joining us in studio. I think I've definitely learned a lot. I have no doubt the viewers have as well. Uh, we'll be following your journey to see where you're taking us along uh, to make sure we become uh, energy and environmentally friendly. Thanks for your time. This is not just about uh, doing it once off. As Mohamed Tahir Khan said, it's also about making sure we have sustainability, about being at zero point for our energy consumption and being environmentally friendly. As South Africans, as Muslims, we need to make a conscious effort to be able to live in a way that doesn't take away from people around us, but in, in actual fact helps and enables people around us as well. I have no doubt that if you follow them on their social media profiles, on their websites, you will find information in terms of how to make yourself energy efficient whether it's for your home, your madrasas, uh, schools, or your massage. Let's make a conscious effort to be able to uh, reduce our own carbon footprint. Shukran so much for joining us on air today. Have a wonderful public holiday. Inshallah, we'll be back again next week. Same time, same place. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.